welcome to the Overlook Hour. I'm your host, Clark Little. Along with me, as always, is Russell John the Fisherman. Uh, uh, hello? <laughs> I'm sorry, it feels inappropriate to laugh, but I I could hear in your voice you're trying to be somber why does it? Why does it feel inappropriate to laugh? I don't know. I don't know. What's appropriate now? I know. Uh, does it feel inappropriate because we're about to eulogize? <laughs> I know. I don't, but we agreed we didn't want to be like mopey or like... I don't know, um, sad. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we are sad. Yeah. But it's, I don't want to, I don't want to. It's been, uh, it's been a weird week and, um, yeah. So, uh, in case you don't know, in case you, uh, maybe cannot read, um, the title of this episode, um, or haven't, um, been updated over social media and whatnot. Um, Eric Christopher Myers, uh, director and friend of the show. Um, passed away last week, and we thought that we wanted to say a, just a few things um, about Eric because uh, Eric was a very important part of the show, um, and actually a very important part of the film festival. Yeah, everything. And um, you know, Frank. And you know, Frank. I never met Eric. You met Eric in Santa Rosa. I never met Eric face to face. You never met him. Mm-mm. No, because he, he was not able to go to the film festival. Uh, but we talked to him several times on this show, and uh, I have been in many email threads with him and Ed Sanchez. And uh, oh, that's right. And <laughs> um, but yeah, what a just a shock. Um, and that's truly what it was. Like when I heard the news, when you shared the news with me uh, via G Chat, because we are up to date boys. Yeah, I know. Um, I just shock. Shock, and um, you know our our hearts certainly go out to his family, um, uh, both his you know biological family and his 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 film fr- family as well. Um, you know Seth, uh, Seth Calic, uh, another uh, former guest on this show, and you know we we still keep uh, tabs on Seth, and um, yeah, it's just uh, just terrible. Do you ever hear that Bill Burr bit? about how uh, his wife could deal with, like, emotion, but he couldn't. And, you know, I forget what it was. They were, like, going to put their dog down or something, and she, like, cries for days, and they get rid of it, and she's, like, she's at peace with it. Yeah. Dude, I do that with everything. So, like, when I heard, dude, Oksana was just a wreck that, like, right away. Like, I picked her up from work, and it was like, oh, she's been crying. Me? Oh, man. I I was kind of worried it was going to hit me now. And I'm like, eh, I'm kind of there, but I don't know. I, I have an unhealthy way <laughs> of like processing this stuff. No, it's, I mean, you know, grief hits you different ways. And just, I, like I said, this was just shock. And, yeah. um, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, like, so a lot of people found out because Adrian Tofey, another former guest from the show, uh, put it out there. God, what a... What a, incestuous dude. little community. Well, we I mean, the found footage community is it's there. It's kind of like shattered, like we always talk about. But though they were working on a project together and I am kind of upset that we're not going to be able to get it now. Could you imagine those two like such interesting minds making found footage film and they were collaborating and yeah, it's a bummer. Um we're we're really gonna miss uh, Eric. I'm I'm actually shocked you never met him. From just the way we met him, I, which again in the interview we play, we we get into that, right? I didn't go back and listen to it, but yeah, um, yeah. But I plan to where where we met him at Silver Screen. I mean, dude, Justin was there. Our uh, you know the former third chair who went on vacation never not came there back. on the interview. Yeah, and uh, Terrell even met him. Like like everybody was there. I'm, I'm bummed you didn't get to meet him in person. He's like a really powerful presence, yeah. But like he had a shy, a shy aura to him when you yeah. met him in person. But he was like respect. He was I don't know. He knew what he was doing, and I remember Silverstream mishandled that fucking thing. They didn't have a Q and A person there, so he just kind of came out. And, yeah, you you mentioned that in the okay, uh, in dude. The interview. I just remember being like. Man, that would crush me. Like the way that I used to get like really anxious doing that. Yeah. Like needing to take control of it. I don't know. I I miss the dude a lot. Yeah, and I mean we're gonna miss his work. You know, we uh, you know we were fans of him and we were fans of his work. 
you know, Butterfly Kisses. I mean, we just stopped talking about that film maybe a few months ago. Yeah, it feels like. Um, so we're we're gonna replay um, an episode, the first episode we did with Eric, um, episode eighty two that goes back to March of twenty eighteen. Um, so this is uh, three and a half years ago, right before the first uh, Unnamed Footage Festival. So like I said, you know, um, you guys, you, Terrell, Justin, Oksana, you were uh, up in Santa Rosa. You saw the film. Um, right after you saw the movie, <laughs> you called me. And oh, I did. You did. Yeah. And you were like, uh, dude. Uh, I just saw a fucking crazy movie. Yeah. Talked with the director. He's here. He's cool. Well, let's do it. I'm like, okay, fine. Great. Yeah. I remember Madeline. And, the, uh, and then you sent me a link. Madeline, the the other mind behind the Unnamed Footage Festival, was just like, you can't do that. You can't book a film while at another film fest for... By the way, two weeks from the film fest? Three weeks? Yeah, I think it was like three. But then, you know, Madeline worked with another film fest at that time. Maybe a month. And she got butterfly kisses, and he went out there and I did a QA and a with them. Yeah. I mean, he really felt like family. Um, Man, I'm bummed we never got to do one with them out here, though. Like in person. Because do you remember how much we talked about that? We tried to fly him out a few times to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's a bummer. He'll be missed for sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah cool dude man yeah, yeah. and, and um, also also didn't he didn't you say that he also guessed it on the bfg yeah if people want to do a deep cut i think on their youtube channel under the barely functional gamers you can see him talk to to chris the eddie the gamer ghoul who stepped in for randy as an early engineer here if you want to see that well, dude, i mean him 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 on barely functional gamers that's what did it dude i do <laughs> I man, he he fucking pushed that film so hard, man. And I mean, to put up with those two in an interview, yeah. like, yeah, that that's a B cut right there. So I uh, I vetted the episode today, uh, and man, it man, it was just Eric's just a great talker, man. Um, it's this is a strange episode because. Uh, we've changed a lot in three and a half years. I was going to say, I'm not worried about Eric. But I feel like my voice has changed in three and a half years. Well, how are we? Are we bad? You don't speak a whole lot, I re- which is weird. I, re- I speak <laughs> too much and I hate it. Um, I remember in the early days being terrified to talk. I Maybe that was it. Just It seems like forever ago and not so long ago at the same time. Because I remember us sitting down talking to him, and I remember this conversation pretty vividly. And like when, when I was listening back to it, I remember it pretty much beat by beat. Yeah. And um, also I will say that uh, at the beginning of the, of the uh, interview, Eric does mention that he shared the same name as a stand-up comedian named Eric Myers. Uh, we should just give you a little heads up. Uh, that guy's also dead, too. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but how? So, um, from the little bit of research I, I did on the internet, um, that Eric Myers was struck by a van outside of Amarillo, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Man, I love Eric. And if he were here, he would... <laughs> He would be laughing with us, as inappropriate as it is. But, you know, they say uh, all I know what dark do. humor is something that is only shared among uh, very smart people, which is clearly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I think, uh, Russ, and we'll, we'll, we'll put this to bed here and uh, throw it to the um, episode 82, and uh, we'll see you all guys next week. But um, I think that uh, to put all this to bed is that we finally have to watch his first movie. Oh, I know. I've been thinking a lot about it. Roulette? Roulette. Yeah. It looks good, too, honestly. I think he won an award for it. Yeah. In, in, the, in, in the interview, he describes it as Lars von Trier. <sighs> All right. Also, I should mention, um, episode 118, we have um, Seth, Reed, and Rachel from Butterfly Kisses on there, too. I also remember coordinating that with Eric. Was an ordeal. Yeah, that was our first three-hour episode. Yeah. Well, what, really? Mm-hmm. And it was all interviews? It was all interviews. It was our first three-hour episode, and I'm like, never again. <laughs> oh, boy. Little did you know. Yeah. Became the thing. All right. Well, um, again, rest in peace, Eric, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Oh, 
Eric, when you, when you told me earlier that we should uh, refer to you not as Eric Myers because there's a local comedian out there, I had to hold back because Clark also has a doppelganger who is way more famous. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. We may or may not have looked up his uh, number one <laughs> viewed YouTube video. Yeah, we do very different work. <laughs> <laughs> Very different work. But yeah, no, there is a Hawaiian surfing photographer <laughs> named Clark Little. And, awesome. Uh, yeah, it's it's very di- because I you've you've got a good way with you, Eric Christopher. My, that's a good middle name combination. Mine, Clark William, I don't like. I don't I don't like how I could go as Clark William Little. It seems like a mouthful to me. And William, I just don't find that a very attractive name to say. And I don't want to say Clark W. Little because I sound like some sort of deacon or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, or or you could sound like, like a rap artist and you could be Little Clark or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's, yeah. C-Dub. That'd be C-Dub. Another. Yeah, yes. C- C-W. That makes me sound like a truck driver. Or a bad or you network. Could be Not Clark that there's anything. W. <laughs> If you were Clark W, you'd be like Clark W Griswold, except you'd be like Little Griswold. Exactly. Yeah. And I actually do use Clark W sometimes, but it's not. It's not, I even thought about changing my middle initial to like S or something, because that's what Harry S. Truman. <laughs> the, the, the S doesn't stand for anything. Yes, this is true. This yeah. Is true. What? Yeah, you didn't know that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why do you know that? Because I know knowledgeable things. <laughs> okay. This is. Common American history. This was, is bar trivia, man. This that, is, this this is, is <laughs> you're like high scorer at Bennigan's or whatever when you've got you know that sort of useless knowledge. <laughs> deep pull. <laughs> Don't age yourself with a Bennigan's reference now. That's going cool. deep. <laughs> Are they still around? I don't, I don't know. Do you know <laughs> I have no idea. You don't have Bennigan's over here? Is that an East Coast there's, thing? L- there's just like a handful of them over here. So, and, and true story, I used to sit in a Bennigan's because it was the only place that had a smoking section. And that was where I would write my first screenplays. And I, they would actually be performed in the smoking section by the guy who stars in Butterfly Kisses. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Really, really going all the way back 20 years. Now, at the end, we're going to ask you, we're going to go back. Uh, we're going to circle around and get to the uh, early screenplays, because that's something we like to um, ask all of our filmmaker friends um, about their first screenplay. So get ready for that question. It's coming, but we won't get there yet. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So you're calling us uh, from Baltimore, is that right? Yes. Yes. Now, a quick question. Is it the correct pro- – is Baltimore is, – is that or is that, like, wrong? Is it Baltimore? How like, like New Orleans? How, yeah. How how is a local? How does a local say the city? Uh, a, a local would slur it and call it Balmer. Balmer. Um, and we have one of the worst regional accents of any place. <laughs> so I think Baltimore is completely acceptable. That's acceptable. Is that's completely acceptable? Is the dialect <laughs> similar to like Philly, like the drawn out thing? It is, um, and we are so proud of it out here that uh, it's sort of like a, a badge of honor. The worse your accent is, um, somehow the more civic pride you have. And I have actually made a point with every film I've ever made that if somebody opens their mouth and they have a Baltimore accent, I'm like, Fuck off. No, no, no. You're not going to be in my movie. With the exception of Butterfly Kisses, where the lead actress is constantly, like, twanging all over the place. And I'm like, well, it sounds real. Um, you know, it goes into the whole meta thing. She sounds like she's from Baltimore, so. I didn't even notice. Did you ever have an accent? And- no, no. And, and radio definitely bred any potential accent out of me. I get that, but I purposefully have kept mine. I think just out of spite. Well, there's something to be said for, you know, bucking conventions and, you know, flipping the bird. That's pretty punk rock. Well, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I'm from the South and then I move out here to California where everyone speaks so with such a sterile nature that, you know, I, I had to kick things up a bit, Eric, you know, trying to live life there over you, here. You're, you're, you're adding some spice. Got to. One more thing about Baltimore, okay. and then we'll close gonna, the book. Yeah. Wait, I, what do you think? I, I thought you were going to mention your favorite show. Yeah. We got, I thought right. you were going to say The Wire, Freddie Gray, <laughs> um, 
Sheila Dixon, where are you going? Yeah, are do, are y'all tired of the fucking wire? Is that a thing? Dude, the wire is fucking fantastic. I uh, love I, 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 it's my favorite thing. Oh my god, it's it's great. Everybody loves the wire out here, and so many of the uh, uh, the folks in the local community, uh, the film community, have been involved in some way. You know, right down to like you know the professors at the school that I attended. And, you know, I mean, everybody has been involved with The Wire. So, so it's, it's, been, it's a, been a good a thing honor. for Baltimore. Totally. I don't I, I, I haven't met anyone that's been like, oh, fuck The Wire. It portrays us <laughs> as being so da, 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 da. Rather, people are going, yup, that's right. You will get shot in the face if you're driving down North Avenue. So, yeah, yeah, it's we're, we're proud of it. So you don't think it, it didn't paint the town or the, the it didn't paint the city or the residents in any sort of bad light? We just you take no. that as a badge and honor. Of honor. Okay. As I'm going to mutter through my words here. I think that every metropolitan area is going to have um, a particularly bad crime pocket, and in our case, um, I think that a lot of the pride comes not so much from um, the fact that it you know could be conceived as as being a glorification of violence, but rather the fact that uh, it's it's just handled so realistically. And it is so true to what our community is, both the good and the bad, and the depictions of, you know, of of, of uh, the press and schools and everything like that. Um, you know, I, I think that that's where a lot of the pride comes in. It's not a homogenized or sanitized version of, you know, crime and and law and order, essentially. It's a very democratic way of looking at it, <laughs> uh, and it's just it's just fucking great. And it's fantastic. So, yeah. Yes. Both Russell and I are big fans. Randy didn't make it all the way through because he's got commitment issues. Ah, uh, commitment issues. You didn't make it all the way through? Not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like mid mid the last season. Oh, weird. Season five? I don't I, get that. I like season five. Yeah. Yeah, season five, man. I mean, there's some people who thought it jumped the shark there at the very end, but I thought it was pretty great. Now, you 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 worked in radio, yes? Yes. So do you have a journalism background? Uh, I have a, uh, I have a film background, okay. um, with a, with an emphasis, a focus on, uh, writing and directing, but, um, I ended up talking my way into a radio gig and I worked for XM for a couple of years. And then I worked for another major market out here, WTOP. And, um, yeah, I, I only left XM because Sirius bought us. And when that happened, it was just like, everybody was redundant. And so we were all laid off and it was yeah. like getting dumped by a girlfriend that was really hot. <laughs> and, you know, it was, I just, I never got over it. What was the gig? Uh, I was a reporter and a producer. Um, I oversaw like 21 traffic and weather channels plus the emergency alert. And yeah, it was, it was cool, man. It was a lot of fun. And I got to, you know, rub shoulders with a lot of celebrities because there was always somebody famous there walking in the hall with you. Um, I actually, I screamed at Don Cheadle in my mind once and he turned around and he heard it. <laughs> now, was this, was this to, you wanted to subconsciously get his uh, attention or was there an underlying was, anger of Don Cheadle? Maybe he cut you off, got the last donut in the break room. What's it? Walk I us through it. I forget what movie he was there promoting. Uh, the director was uh, Casey, Cassie Lemons. Um, talk to me. It was something like, I forget what it was. Called. Oh yes, yes, but, uh, yes. Yeah. And he was, uh, and I was, um, running out of my studio to run to the bathroom cause we were understaffed and I was like carrying like three reporters workloads and I was just like going crazy and I was like, Oh my God, I'm drinking so much coffee and I got to take a pee. And I ran to the bathroom and as I'm coming back, um, there was this entourage in front of me walking down slowly into my department. Cause we, you know, we had VIP visitors getting the tour all the time. And it was just like this mass of people from one side of the hall to the next. And I'm trying, you know, to get around or by, and nobody is moving and I've got to be on the air 30 seconds ago. And there's this, there's this African American dude right in front of me. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm only five, seven. And this guy was like three feet taller, three feet shorter than me. And I'm just like, get the fuck out of my way. And he turns around and gives me the stare and it's the Don Cheadle stare. And I, I was just that. like, 
no. And I was like, oh, shit, it's Don Cheadle. Holy dude. Boogie Nights is one of my favorite movies. But, you know, I, I hoped that he heard that in my brain. Rather, I was just like, ah, excuse me. And, you know, sort of darted through. Eric, I hate to tell you, the only thing I gleaned from the story is that Don Cheadle's very short. <laughs> He's very short and he has a very intense face. Oh, I've seen that face. Not in real life. Yeah. Thank God. It's pretty intense. <laughs> The next, if I'm out there again uh, and you get a couple of drinks in me, I'll tell you my George Carlin story. And that's not something I can tell, unfortunately, while uh, anything is recording. But it's like, my, well, <laughs> here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to write a note. We'll see how the rest of the interview goes. Maybe we'll circle around. All right. We're just building friendships, building relationships there. There you go. Yes. It's one of the stories that I tell once I've had a couple of drinks and I'm like, ah, oh, this is like this, the thing that happened to me. It's yeah. My George Carlin. Well, story it's is. close to 10 p.m. your time, you know, <laughs> maybe knock off a couple. It's friendly, exactly. all, all well, friendly here. Uh, before I want to get into one more thing, I was uh, I looked at your IMDb page here and then I came across a note that was uh, quite interesting. Uh, what can you tell us about um, your involvement with uh, Paul Schrader's Exorcist movie? Um, it, short version of a very long story. I was uh, a writer for a popular horror website that, that's no longer online. But um, I was a writer for this website and something that I've written a lot on and that I'm known for in some circles is the Exorcist franchise. And I've, I've written some articles that have been published in books and stuff like that on the subject. And um, if you know anything about that prequel, uh, Paul Schrader was hired to make one. And the studio, Morgan Creek, said, well, this sucks. It's too slow. It's not scary enough. And they did something that was really unprecedented, which was they fired him and they replaced him with like his equal and opposite, Rennie Harlan. And they brought Rennie Harlan in and they kept essentially the same cast, the same sets, more or less the same script and the same cinematographer. And they had him completely remake the movie from scratch. And after they uh, had completely was, shot the film, after they would completely shot the film. And so they essentially took a thirty five million dollar movie and they just stuck it on a shelf. And so Rennie Harlan remade this movie. It came out in 2004 as Exorcist the Beginning, and it was savaged by critics of whom I was one. And um, it was just it, it, it completely underperformed on its own merits. But even more so when you go, they made two movies, so it had to at least recoup the cost of both. And what ended up happening was uh, there was so much talk in the press about the fact that there was this whole other version of the movie sitting there by this, you know, famous auteur. And it was like, well, what was that movie? You know, it was, th this has never happened before. And it's, it's like the ultimate film school experiment. You know, you give the same script to two different directors and the same cast and the same crew and you go, okay, make your version and let's watch them back to back. And so it became this giant question mark and Schrader was getting a lot of press about this happening and I called him up and I said, can I see it? And um, he had me out to New York and I went to his office. He was a hero of mine. I studied his scripts when I first started screenwriting. Sure. And um, I, uh, I got to watch it in his office. And I not only got to watch it, I got to write the very first review. And he took me out to lunch and let me turn on a tape recorder and he talked for an hour and he like the gag was off and he just gave all the dirt. And when this went online, both my my review and my interview, uh, it got me quoted in Variety. It got me into Fangoria. It got me all over the place. And uh, the studio went, well, shit, let's screen this movie at a uh, film festival. So they showed it in Brussels a month later and the press all came out. And apparently everybody had read my review and was like really amped to see it, all the, like all the press. And uh, they gave it a glowing review and the studio issued it for a limited theatrical release and put it out on DVD. Um, so that was like my sort of magic hour, I guess. Well, thanks for being a part of the studio monster <laughs> system, man. 
<laughs> it was it was cool. I got I got a lot of quotes until uh, you know Roger Ebert reviewed it, and then suddenly everybody said, "Well, fuck that Eric guy." You know, this is Roger Ebert, so <laughs> oh. splashed his quotes all over the place. Did he he gave it a positive review? He did. He gave it a really good review. This is a this is a crazy story, man. Yeah, I have adventures. Like what? Uh, like yeah, Paul Schrader is a titan, <clears throat> especially in the screenwriting world. Like what's What's going through your mind when he's like, yeah, come to my office. We'll watch it. Like what? Uh, I, I was, I was, my head was spinning to be very honest with you. And that was sort of like my first, um, major celebrity contact. And, you know, by the time I'd worked at XM, I was, you know, running into people, you know, in, in, from film and from music and sports every five seconds. And, you know, the glow just goes away. Suddenly you're like, you know, they're just people and some of them are assholes and some of them are really nice. But um, this was like the first time that I'd met somebody who was a personal hero and got to spend time with him. You know what I mean? And it was. It, but, but, you know, I, I, I had, you know, my business face on and um, I kept it professional the entire time. And we've stayed in touch. I've actually hung out with his kid a couple of times when uh, his, his son has come to, to Baltimore. So it was, yeah, it was pretty surreal, but in a, in a very positive way. Russ, do you even know who Paul Schrader is? Um, not by name, but when I decided that I was going to be a horror fan and I wasn't going to play in the NFL, I, uh, <laughs> and I, also I, you I, should I, know he I, never played organized football. Go no, ahead. no, but I, when that, I decided I was going to be beaten up. Yeah, that, <laughs> that happened at a point and I returned to all the franchise films just because I felt like I had to. And when I hit. The Exorcist, I, rem I remember reading about that and being like, oh, there's a really good story here. I'll get back to it. And I never did. Because it's one of those like intimidating, like, oh, a tour director. And then, and that was before I was really into film. I just liked horror movies. You, you, but you remember this crazy. story? No, happened? I totally remember it. Yeah. That's, that's, Schrader you know, is best, he's, he's best known for, as a director, he directed um, Autofocus and Affliction. But as a screenwriter, he wrote Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, The Last Temptation of Christ. Oh, I've heard a podcast you know, with him. I don't know why his name didn't Also, did he do the, uh, the George C. Scott film, Hardcore? Yes, he did that one as yeah. well. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah. that one's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, it, it, the thing that was really depressing for me seeing his version was that when I watched it in his office, I'm watching a mix down from Avid. And it was, you know, an unfinished version of the movie. It had temp music and temp voiceover and stuff like that. And being uh, a filmmaker, I was like, well, I'm savvy enough to know what a, a rough cut looks like. Um, so I'm going to judge it on its own merits and be able to fill in the blanks mentally. The shit part of all of this was that the studio looking to recoup some money, um, took all that goodwill that came out of the Brussels screening and they basically threw it into theaters for a week opposite revenge of the, Sh the Sith, which meant nobody saw it. <laughs> and then when it came out on DVD, the version that came out was what I watched in the office. Oh, it's, it's unfinished. Brutal. Mm. There, yeah, I mean, you got Vittorio Storaro as a cinematographer, and he didn't even get to color correct it. So it's like you can see the lights off camera. You know, I mean, it's it's kind of sad. But if you're if you're into horror and if you're into cinema, it's definitely worth you know getting yourself a bottle of something to drink and sitting down and watching them back to back with some other people that are really into film and sitting there and going, "Holy shit, we've got a whole night of discussion." You know. Man, it's crazy because hearing you talk about this, when I uh, tracked you down after watching your movie in Santa Rosa, I thought you were just a dude who had made a found footage film and kind of like, just as like a filmmaker, you're like, oh, I think this is an interesting medium. I'm going to play in it. I had no idea you were a horror fan. I'm like, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm surprised yeah. right now. It's, I mean, it makes sense, but most of the most... Most of the interesting found footage movies we've watched have been by non-horror fans, so it seemed natural. I was like, oh, he, he knows what he's doing behind the camera. No, I can, I can, I can appreciate that, and um, that, that makes sense to me. Um, I guess part of it is that I just have this philosophy where, you know, if, if I'm going to do any genre, whatever it is, I want to do something different with it, and not because I think that 
uh, something is broken and needs to be fixed. But if you're going to invest a couple of years in a project, you might as well do something that you've never seen before. Uh, that's going to get you excited that you can't wait to see, you well, know, just I, something different. I think a big part of it is um, holding back too, because a lot of the uh, horror filmmakers that make a found footage movie, they, there's almost like, we don't want the audience to get bored. Let's um, do something in the first 10 minutes. And it's like, those movies have a natural tension. And if you just let it build, uh, the payoff is that much better. But I mean, we've seen two cuts of a film before, and uh, love the original that was more cut down. And then the director's cut comes in and it's like, oh, they ruined it. Like, yes. in minute yeah. 10, you're already like, oh, I'm not interested anymore. So Absolutely. No, that that happens. And uh, it's 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 interesting. You know, I, I guess I just sort of felt like um, if I'm going to make a movie in this genre, I, I what what can you say that hasn't been said a thousand times? Um, people are going to anticipate everything you're going to do. So instead, let's be a little self-reflexive and take people off guard and say, yeah, we're, we're, we're commenting on that. We're, we're commenting along with you. So, yeah. When we met Eric at Santa Rosa and we, I mean, Justin, that was the first thing Justin said to him. He said, Hey man, I enjoyed your movie. He came in late by the way. And I was ready to, <laughs> like, I was like, you better not say shit because <laughs> we get into this argument where he's like, well, I missed the first 10 minutes. Who cares? Uh, I can judge the movie. I'm like, motherfucker, you don't know what kind of pacing's established. And to be fair, I said that about, um, that is my mother. I missed like 20 minutes of it. I missed act one. Who cares? Yeah, but that movie's only I, 72 <laughs> minutes long. And then I came yeah, back right. to it. I was like, God, I was, I was just angry. I couldn't find parking is yeah. what that was. But Justin came up to Eric and was just like, hey, man, I liked your movie. And uh, let me tell you, I was watching that movie ready to hate on it. He was like, I was just like, <laughs> give me a re- he's like, give me a reason. That's why I'm watching this movie. Eric, you should I, know I that's say- high praise. <laughs> That no, that that is high praise. Without even knowing him, that you know, I was like, "That's awesome." I'm, you know, because he isn't the first person who said that to me. Um, you know, some people have been like, "Ah, oh, shit, man, a found footage movie," and then they watch it. Went, I was not expecting that. And even if they don't like it, that's fine. But if it takes them off guard and you know holds their interest by virtue of the fact that it's not what they expected, that's really cool. I wish you guys had come the next day, actually, because we had a substantially bigger crowd. Oh, um, I don't know if uh, what I was told by some of the vendors was actually the, the first screening happened and uh, people started talking and there was apparently a buzz that went around the place. And then the next morning I, and I was thinking, Oh shit. Well, you know, the next screening is 11 o'clock in the morning. Nobody's going to come to this. <laughs> and people just started coming in and, and filling up. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is great. So it was a lot of fun. How long have you been uh, touring the movie, doing the festival circuit? Um, that was the second screening. Uh, we sort of unveiled it. We, we unveiled it at a, a, a festival called Spooky Movie uh, in Washington, D.C. at the AFI. And um, I was asked if I would show it. And what we decided to do to build um, buzz for it was the AFI hooked onto the idea of we're going to make it the closing film of the festival and we are going to promote it as a surprise secret screening. And so that nobody has any idea what they're going to watch when they sit down and then it just starts playing and people are like, what the fuck is this? (laughs) And it, it worked. You know, like I was scared that like maybe three people would show up and instead we, we were almost at full occupancy and um, the movie just started. And there were a lot of people afterwards who were like, I was with you until this point or I was with you until that point or I was with you all the way. How much of this was real? I don't even know. And I was like, exactly. That's that's why I haven't cut a trailer for it yet. You know, do you watch the movie with the crowd? I do. Actually, I don't really watch the movie so much as I watch the people watching the movie. Because you've seen the movie enough times. You're good. I, there's that, but also, you know, you're waiting for are, are people going to laugh at the right parts? Right. Are they going to laugh at the wrong parts? Are they going to get scared at the right moments? You know, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm sort of analyzing for where the movie works and where it doesn't. And so far, it seems to be working. So I have absolutely no complaints. Do you feed off that? Cause I like, do. Cause like I, you know, I, 
as a live performer, you know, I, I kind of get that, <laughs> but you can also like tweak it as you go with this, this movie's in the can, like you can't really tweak a whole lot. So what, what exactly are you getting out of it? If, if the stuff doesn't hit and plus, you know, people are different. Crowds are different. They are. And, um, it, it's, it's interesting because this movie is playing very differently, uh, than my last one did and because they're very different films. Um, but you know, that one was very serious and very much a European art house, Lars von Trier style sort of film. And this is a little more playful. Um, it's a little bit more fun, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm not feeling the one thing you really feel is you're sitting there and you're watching other people watch it is you're feeling the runtime in a way that you don't when you're watching it yourself and you're starting to sort of feel the energy in the room where people start to titter or people start to get bored. Are you losing them? It's just this, this, you know, this alchemy that, that, you know, is very palpable and um, I'm not feeling that with this. And that's a, I guess what I get out of that and answer your question is, you know, it, it, you're just adding that to your, your, your toolkit as you're moving forward. Um, okay. Now I, I know the sort of pacing, I know the sort of, um, the sort of engine that the film, the story needs. It's, it's, it's all a learning experience. When you were writing this script, did you always, are we, are we doing the interview right now? I'm not sure. Are we doing the interview or are we just shoot the shit? Oh, we're in it. Are we in it? Yeah, we've been in it. I didn't know we were in it. I would have been more prepared. Now I'm just running my mouth. No, okay. Are you kidding hey, me? This uh, is Eric, great. You know, I, I predicted this may have happened. I was like, I, I, Eric's such a professional. I bet he's waiting for a go. But I knew if I gave that to you, Clark would be mad. Because this is what he always wanted. It's just candid conversation. Just, no, no, no. This is cool. This is cool. You can yeah. cut this part out. Or you leave it in and embarrass me. No, no. It's, it's going to be great. there. Um, you know, I, I uh, my communication skills is akin to verbal Vaseline. Just <laughs> easing the way in, baby. That's hot. No. See? That's, that's hot. You that's should, what you morning. didn't see is that me just staring into Russell's eyes as I said that to make him very uncomfortable. Mission awesome. we're accomplished. All, we're all work. being professional here, and that's that's what matters. But uh, So let's go back to... I, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that you would have hung around and just Shot the shit with us for how long have we been talking? Yeah, we've been talking for like 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm not that interesting. It's fine. I usually have people running for the hills once I start telling stories. So oh, you're good. You know, actually, after talking to you now, you're in your film. And if I hadn't seen it, I would think you'd be the focal point of the movie. But you're actually kind of like reserved in the film. I don't you could carry a film. You've got a presence and a good voice. I don't I'm a fan. Oh, thank you. I, you know, <laughs> one of the, one of the hardest parts about being in the movie was the fact that I had to be in the movie. And, um, you know, there's, there's that, that old adage that, you know, you never write for and direct yourself. Um, there are very few directors who can do that successfully. And part of that is just that, you know, there's, there's always going to be a self uh, glorification, a level of self-importance. You're going to shoehorn yourself into more scenes or, um, you know, lay a certain emphasis on yourself that maybe is, is detracting from the narrative or the other characters. Um, but uh, apart from that, you know, I'm not Orson Welles and I have no interest in being an actor or eating yourself um, to death <laughs> or eating myself to death. Well, no, that, that actually sounds good because I am a foodie, but, um, I have no interest <laughs> in being Unicron. Um, but with that being said, uh, it, I'm, I'm not an actor. And I realized that if I was going to do the movie that I envisioned, I was going to have to be in it, but I didn't necessarily want to be in it. And one, but it was actually a selling point as I went and I approached all of these other non-actors and asked them to play themselves. And in some cases, um, had them, uh, present themselves in ways that could be perceived as unflattering. And, you know, I was, uh, I gave the, the sales pitch and the sales pitch was, look, I'm in the movie too. And I'm going to be playing kind of a, you know, a Saturday morning cartoon version of myself. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be a schlubby manipulative douchebag director who's taking advantage of this other guy 
you know, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a caricature. And so I was happy to sort of play a, you know, a, a dickhead version of myself, though some people might say, hey, that's just Eric. <laughs> was this the first time you ever put yourself in front of the camera? Uh, it, yes, it was the first time I ever directed myself. How? You say that, <laughs> but how does one do that exactly? Um, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I approached the project um, very, very early on with a mission statement. And the mission statement was, this has to be as close to an actual documentary as humanly possible. Um, yes, there was a screenplay, but I wanted to also have the freedom to go off book. And I needed people who were able to sort of slip into that reality, but I needed to be able to create that reality. And part of that was um, collaborating with the cinematographer and co-editor, uh, a guy named Kenny Johnson, who is uh, very well known in our area and especially in the wrestling uh, community for being a documentary filmmaker. Um, this guy has won a lot of awards and he's very, very good at what he does. And I didn't just want a cinematographer. I needed somebody who understood documentary, how to shoot it, how to approach it and how to edit it. And so I, I collaborated with him and I collaborated with actors who understood improvisation. And part of it was, I didn't give the actors full scripts. I only gave them their scenes. And so, for example, in the found footage, um, you have the, the two characters, the, the guy and the girl. And what I would do is they would get their script pages uh, the night before we would shoot. So they had no idea where their story was going. Um, but during the week leading up to that, we had this game where uh, I was... I, I was like a Jiminy Cricket sort of character. And what I would do is I would send them text messages and the text messages were specifically not for me. They were their characters, inner thoughts coming to the surface. <laughs> and I'd be like, what do you think about when he said that to you? What do you think when she did that? And they'd start riffing on that. And I started planting thoughts into their heads. And as their characters start to go down different paths, they would only see the pages for themselves and the other person wouldn't know what was happening with the other person. Um, and so I started splitting them off and uh, I, I did that through the entire process. And so I guess uh, the, the roundabout thing I'm trying to, to come to is that when it was time for me to be in the film and time for my crew to be in the film as well, we were all sort of, you know, immersed in that reality and we were just able to go with it and sort of respond. You know, there were moments where, you know, in the edit, I chose places where we stumbled over our words because it felt more real. Um, there were moments like there's a scene outside of a really legitimately shitty and shady motel uh, toward the end of the film. And we were nervous because the property guy was like standing outside <laughs> and scoping us as well as the prostitutes. And... <laughs> I, I think I even comment on that on screen. I'm like, you know, and like, we're kind of like sort of keeping our heads ducked and trying not to be seen. It, it just, it, it made it real. And so we were able to inhabit that moment and it didn't feel like we were acting. And it was just sort of like, run the camera, get this over with. Let's just get out of here. So it made it real. I want to talk about the folklore of what your narrative focuses on in terms of the for lack of a better term, the boogeyman that exists. Russell Ooh. hates what he is that term. Um, is this, <laughs> and I'm completely oblivious to this, is this something that, is this local folklore? Is this uh, something that you created? Um, I'd love, to, I'd love to, to play along and say that it is all completely real. Uh, it's not. Um, the, the story in the movie <laughs> is that there is this haunted train tunnel, Ilchester Tunnel, that um, has been there since 1903, and that it is haunted by an apparition known as Peeping Tom or the Blink Man or any number of names based on what generation you're from and 
what the kids were calling it on the playground. And if you go to Ilchester Tunnel at the stroke of midnight and stand on the trestle staring down the tracks to the uh, the exit on the far end, and you stare for one solid hour without blinking your eyes, which is a superhuman thing and uh, (laughs) no one can do, if you're able to do that, then Peeping Tom appears at the end of the tunnel. Um, the gag is, however, once you've seen him, you can't unsee him. And no matter where you look, no matter where you are, he's always going to be in the distance. And every time you blink, he gets one step closer and one step closer and one step closer until he's nose to nose with you. And as you're holding your eyes open or trying to prevent that last blink, he reaches out with his long eyelashes and he butterfly kisses your cheeks, which tickles you, makes you blink, and then he scares you to death. Um, <laughs> That's the the urban legend in the film. Now, the reality is that Ilchester Tunnel is a real place. Um, it is part of the B&O uh, railroad system. And it's a place that in Ellicott City, uh, Maryland, is, which is Ellicott City in general, is uh, reputedly haunted. You know, all the shops, all the, the taverns and hotels, everywhere has got a ghost story. And um, so this train tunnel, which is just a really, really creepy place to begin with, it's a a spot where teenagers go and they hoot and holler at night and they run around and they scare themselves to death. And everybody knows with finger quotes that it's haunted. Um, I thought it would be fun to take a place that was believed to be haunted in real life and say, all right, what if I concoct this urban legend, and there's a, you know, it's not just that it's haunted by a, a boogeyman, but um, it's sort of a Bloody Mary game where you, you know, you have to conjure something up. Right. And you can come up with all sorts of grisly tales about what happened afterward and scare yourselves at your fifth grade sleepover or whatever. But, um, you know, to, to and, and the other rule here with it being an urban legend and it always having happened to a friend of a friend of a friend and there being no real way of verifying any of these stories is that it had to have that component uh, where you can't just go out and disprove it immediately. So you have to have somebody that really could hold their eyes open for that long. And most people can't. And so as a result of that, you know, it's it's always that story uh, that my brother told me about that girl who went to the school down the street and babysat for her cousin and her cousin did that. Um, You know, I I thought that that would just be a fun thing to play with. And being that I'm really, really, really into um, the paranormal and cryptozoology and urban legends and conspiracy theories, uh, all from the the skeptical side. Um, I thought it would be kind of cool to play with the concept of false memory syndrome and see if in this very meta film, if I took a real place and that people know and remember hearing stories about to begin with, and then I cook up this urban legend that even if people were to see this movie and go, oh, it's a fake movie, it's, it's, it's not really a documentary, that hopefully they go, oh, well, you know, it's that fake documentary about that real urban legend. I heard about that when I was eight. Um, and see if that would work. And what's been really, really cool is that along the way, what I've sort of done outside of the film is I wrote a number of articles for a number of websites under pseudonyms and uh, put this story out there as being a real legend. What? And (laughs) along the way, it's been getting picked up on other websites. Um, There is a a YouTube channel for uh, the paranormal. They did an episode on it. Um, There have been Reddit threads. Uh, it's on Creepypasta. It's popped up in all these places now. You say and- you're not Orson Welles, <laughs> but this is some Orson Welles shit right here, my friend. The, the most gratifying thing for me has been as I've been doing interviews for uh, the film festivals right now, every time I sit down to do – almost every time I sit down to do an interview, uh, people are asking me uh, or, or more or less taking for granted that the urban legend is real. 
So, you know, when I'm hearing festival directors doing interviews and they're saying, oh, yeah, it's this great movie that's going to be playing about that, you know, that 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 old wives tale about the, the haunted train tunnel. I'm like, cool. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> It's so good. Well, you just outed yourself as creating. A, so, all right. After this story, oh. I mean, we're getting to the the George Carlin thing. So, just get ready for that. It, I, I'm I've got a bottle of scotch here, so I'm getting ready. But, but um, I right, go ahead. Yeah, the, after Silverstream, he told us this, mm -hmm. and I was like, well, dude, even if you claim to have made this up, there will always be people who are like, no, he's a liar. Because I heard about this before him. And there was one where a dude in Brazil was a journalist and he made up a story trying to uh, prove how dumb conspiracy theorists were that Avril Lavigne had died and she had a doppelganger uh, take over. And he, he took like one picture and was like, see, this is not her. This is the fake. And you can tell because her hair is a different color or it's something like so trivial. And then a bunch of people were like, yeah, she is dead. I know it's true. And then he was like. He let it build a little bit, and then he went, no, you idiots, I made it up. And I just did it to prove to you that people will latch on to anything. And then I went, no, you're a liar, and you're a false flag, and uh, you're oh just here to get us off the trail. So I'm like, I, what false is an flag. urban legend? You know what I mean? Without a, Eric, uh, what's your middle name? Christopher My Myers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dude on stage telling bits about it. Yeah, and, and Taco Bell as well. But, yeah, um, diary and Taco Bell. The, the main reason that, you know, I'm happy to take credit for it is, you know, it's, it's not so much, a, uh, you know, a patting myself on the back so much as it is uh, self-protection because um, <laughs> all I need now is somebody to go, hey, let's make a better movie than Butterfly Kisses about that story. Go, no, no, I hold the copyright. You can't do that. I don't, um, I don't know what that would even be. <laughs> I mean, just – you know, hearing your background in horror films and uh, being a film lover and then hearing the experimental approach and then using cinema verite and then non-actors. And, oh, man, I can only imagine what a studio version of Butterfly Kisses would look like. Yeah, I, oh. I don't know. I, I think in a lot of ways it would probably be inferior um, simply because, you know, it's going back to the the, the Exorcist prequel thing. You know, it's going to be like, well, you got to shoehorn more of this in and. It's got to be scarier and it's got to blah, 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 blah. And in a lot of cases, what makes independent films so good when they work is, you know, the whole art from adversity thing. Uh, you, you have to find ways to make your story just as compelling without having the money or the resources to do these sorts of things. It was very um, exciting and terrifying at the same time when – about a year ago, as I was really in the thick of the film, um, the post-production process, I was contacted by somebody who said, Eric, you're not going to believe this. And this was somebody in the know. Um, they were they were like, yeah, I just I got a message from uh, somebody who read about Peeping Tom on a website and contacted me and said, dude, we, we got to hurry up and get a movie going before somebody else scoops this up. And I was like, OK. It's going to be a fine line to walk when this movie comes out. You know, how much how much do I want to play along with it and how much do I want to go? It's just a movie, guys. Um, it's hard to say, you know, because you don't want to. You know, you don't want to, 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 to take away from the film's playfulness the way that it, it you know, makes reality malleable. Um, by telling people too much going in and rather I prefer that people are just able to sit down and let the film have its way with them. Yeah. Watching it without context would be amazing. And I, I didn't even read, uh, the, um, synopsis in the program schedule when we were at the film fest. I was like, Oh, it's found footage. I'm in, but I don't know how many people are like that. Mm -hmm. And we went in there. We, what the fuck am I watching? I was like, where's the schedule? Is this like, what are we like? What is this? It, you know, if if you're listening to this and you're going to come out to the film fest, like you should, bring a friend and tell them it's real. I would just love to hear a story about that, where you just get somebody ready. Like, oh, there's this weird documentary that just came out, and it happened to fit the medium. Well, you're talking to the guy. You're looking at the guy who's got to intro this film. So, I, uh, I mean, oh, ew, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, Eric, so so can you give me the since I can't be there, unfortunately, and it's killing me that I can't. <laughs> can you give me the dry run of of your introduction? Oh, you're assuming, uh... Eric. Uh, let me tell you a quick little story. Give you a quick bio of one Clark Little. Now, again, as a reminder, not the Hawaiian surfing photographer. <laughs> Uh, I kind of play it, you know, I kind of play it as it goes, seat of the pants kind of guy. No, I, I, I don't know yet. Um, I'll probably know uh, the week before. I, I, I am planning to have uh, stuff written out for everything. It just just a, a couple minutes spiel on each film. But, I mean, I'm talking to the guy right now. Anything, anything you want me to add in there, if you want me to play it however you want to, I am open for all suggestions. Well, you're not going to get my George Carlin story in black. Oh. <laughs> now I'm interested how you're going to do it. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, uh, just, just just tell everybody it sucks. This movie sucks. Go home and, and hopefully they'll yeah. stick around. Here's some and, shit and I crowbarred in in the last week. <laughs> yeah. Like two days before it closes, like I forced everybody to watch a screener. I know. And, yeah, this this guy forced me to show this movie. We had the schedule done. <laughs> yeah. Now it raises an interesting question, Eric, because you you haven't made a trailer for the film. So what? So most of the audience goers who have seen this film really have no notion as to what they're seeing. Yeah, um, actually, I've I've been sitting in front of the the Mac all day cutting the trailer. We are. Um, we are actually uh, negotiating a distribution offer right now. We've actually had about seven or eight or nine offers on the film, which has been cool because I've been able to. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it puts me in a in a really uh, good position to be able to choose what I think is the best option for the film. And one of the the talking points has been. Um, how do you, how do you want to market this film? Uh, you know, what are you wanting on the cover? What do you, you know, those sorts of questions, because this movie could be marketed any one of a million ways. Um, and you know, my hope was always that the, the talking point would be the, the concept of the potentially real documentary about, uh, footage that is in, dispute and that we would withhold that footage or only show little glimpses of it so that what your frame of reference is, is people talking about somebody here in Maryland found this box of tapes. It's got something, you know, that's got people arguing about it, you know, yada, yada, yada. And you're like, Oh God, I got to see this movie. You know, those are real people in the trailer. I, they're all talking about this thing. I've got to see it. Is this, you know, something like serial or making a murderer or the keepers, um, and then they watch it and, you know, hopefully then they are finding the content to be a welcome surprise. Otherwise, you're just marketing as, you know, it's a it's a horror movie. Um, so that's that's been a really delicate line that I've been walking, why I've waited so long to cut a trailer. Every festival is asking for one. Distributors are asking for one. So I'm working on it and I'm trying to find that sweet spot. And it's really, really really difficult with this film because again you could i could hand the file off to five different people with five different angles on what the the selling point is and they produce five different things oh that yeah i could see that how how much footage did you have by the end of shooting um the assembly that i put together and this was leaving things out that i said Okay, I'm I'm not going to use that. It could go in, but I'm not going to use it. I'm only going to keep material that I feel could make the final cut. So excising all of that, and I don't even know how much that was. It was a lot. The first assembly was three hours long. <laughs> and there was there was a minute there where I was talking to the producers and I was saying, should I chop this up into um, you know, five or six episodes and, you know, try to pitch this as a mini series, you know, to Netflix or to whomever else. And we all saw the potential of that. But I think we also saw the potential of just having a quick, punchy 90 minute movie 
um, where you don't really have time to process yeah, all exactly. the meta aspects until it's over. Yep. Because on a show, after every episode, you could talk through it, and then by the end, I could see that, yeah, I don't know. I'm like, eh, who cares? <laughs> who cares? Unless you're sitting there binge watching it. How exactly. Long, how long was the shoot, Eric? Um, we shot the found footage stuff uh, during the winter over a course of about two months. And we were wonderfully blessed by um, the Norse gods with snow, like every day we shot. And, you know, snow added atmosphere. It also adds production value. Um, but it also made everything that we then shot during the summer for another two months uh, in a lot of the same locations look so drastically different. So, you know, when you had the winter environment with the snow on the ground and then you've got the blazing height of summer, um, it, it allowed uh, for, you know, a certain switch to be flicked in your mind and for you to be able to say, OK, yeah, 10 years. It's 10 years between this two, you know, storylines. So it was about four months, but there was a lot that was going on um, before each shoot. And, and not just the typical sort of pre-production stuff, but everything I was doing with these sort of like, you know, acting boot camps, for lack of a better term, and the the sort of um, mind games that the actors and I were all playing together. Uh, and then the fact that after we shot the found footage, which was, you know, more or less just like shooting a movie, when we had to do the documentary, <laughs> uh, aside from the scripted components, there were a lot of interviews with people, and these were non-actors. So it was a whole different game, and it wasn't just that they had to come in and play a part. It was that they had to respond to a film that had already been shot, had already been edited together, had been supplied to them – that they were able to watch, take notes, uh, come up with their own opinions and observations and be able to dissect it and critique it for real. And that's everything from, you know, paranormal people to, uh, you know, folklorists to film critics to a psychologist. It was it was it was a very involved process. You, you know, that is a, a really unique approach there because I hadn't thought of your film. There, there's a structure that I've been calling out when we were doing uh, found footage February. And it's kind of the Phoenix forgotten approach where the first two acts are um, faux documentary about found footage. And the third act is like the reveal. And with your film, you're kind of the found footage is um, it's interspersed the whole movie. And I think it's those really early on non actor interviews that they really sell the movie for me. Like I, uh, I believe it's our um, lead's wife who's like on camera first talking about it. And I, I don't know. It, it was like, what the hell are we watching? Cause she didn't feel, I don't know. It's weird when non-actors have a script, it feels forced in like a way that is unbearable sometimes. And I watch, I mean, a lot of micro budget found footage. Yes, he does. <laughs> And sometimes you're just like, God, it would have been better if you didn't give them any direction and just put them on camera. And you're like, hey, what's up with the ghost? And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's scary. Like that would be more authentic than like them just struggling with these like four lines. Yeah, the trick was for the documentary stuff. And I, I can't I can't say actor names yet just because we want to keep them sort of in the bag until the fall and let everybody be able to sort of take their and bow. Respect the, the dead. Out. Uh, respect <laughs> there the dead, go. exactly. Um, just keep a little bit of that mystique going for those people who aren't listening to this podcast. Um, you know, I, I want to be able to let them all take their bow and get their moment in the sun when the film is released, and we will do a big premiere or something like that. But um, I will say this: for the documentary wrapped around the found footage, I populated it intentionally with real people that, you know, you'd be able to go in and you could Google them or IMDB them or whatever, and they'd show up. Um, the way to get a performance out of a non-actor, I found, particularly when I needed them to be more convincing, because we had to sell this as being real, or at least allow you to suspend disbelief enough to believe that it could potentially be a real documentary about 
potentially fake footage, um, was to put these real people in the situation and make sure that whoever they were with who was an actor was an actor who knew how to provoke a response. And my lead, who's just probably listening to this right now and <laughs> chewing on his arm. He was um, amazing. Because he was I, great. Because I can't name him. Um, he is fantastic at provoking a response uh, such that this character who is supposed to have a very overwhelming personality um, to the point where he alienates everybody in his life um, managed very, very successfully to alienate the <laughs> non-actors who were in the film because they didn't meet him. They met the character. He showed up in character to the set um, and he just went right into it, even when the cameras weren't rolling. And when all was said and done and he would leave, you know, he's saying to me, oh, those guys are so cool and they hate me now. They hate me. And I'm like, don't worry, they'll meet the real you. I promise. And they'll love you. But this is, you know, when, when he's getting dirty looks and side eyes and stuff, it's, it's real. It, it, and it, he brought that out of these people successfully. And, um, that's that for me was the, that was the, the golden ticket. I had never thought of that. I, from talking about so many found footage movies in like a critical form, I thought I had figured out like the way to make one. And it's like, yeah, you have a three structure act. The first two, you make your characters funny, get them endearing. Then you go to the end, try not to show too much. Everybody's a non-actor and damn it. I hearing you talk about having an actor provoke people kind of explains why alien abduction plays so flat in like a real way we have like sure. a family of people and they're just like in the woods and you're like god this feels like home movies like straight up and it's kind of because i don't know they're all non-actors just like yeah bumbling around but when you have like one dude and they're he's pulling reactions out of people i don't it animates the film in like a totally i don't want to say more entertaining because you don't lose that field of reality while doing it but it's like I don't. I guess it could hold a casual audience. Is that a better way to yeah. put it? You've seen the yeah. film, right? Thumbs yeah. up. Okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, no, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, and it's it, it. It was something that I thought this is either going to work or it's going to fall completely flat. It, there, it, there's going to be no middle ground. It's either going to be great or it's going to be terrible, and. Um, so I was very, very specific in who I selected in that key role. Um, and I think there were times where, you know, some of my crew didn't quite understand why I was spending as much time playing these games with the actors uh, as I was. Um, not that, you know, they were in any way, you know, upset about it as far as I knew. I, I just don't think that they quite fully understood why I was doing what I was doing. Um, some of them got it and other people saw the movie afterwards like, oh, I see what you're doing. And then other people are like, yeah, well, they're actors. They, they could get there anyway. But, um, you know, every director's got their, their, their path that they walk to get what they're trying to get on screen. And in my case, I felt that uh, particularly with the non-actors, I really needed to find a way to make this reality work for them. And so that then it would work for all of us too. Like, you know, going back to what I was saying about how did I act on camera? How did the other crew act on camera? It was just that we were sort of in this world and it was just sort of happening. Well, and it, it was really cool. Being mean to non-actors is pretty traditional uh, following the, the Blair Witch Project where they had like drill sergeant march him through the woods and feed him less and less every day and wake a bump in the middle of the night. I, I don't know. It's it sounds like you did your homework, which I can't believe I didn't get that when I first talked to you. I was just like, dang, this guy's just got like talent and it's like raw. And he just made this movie that works really well. No, I'm, I'm just I'm old and I've read too many books. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that that growing up, I was always in theater and I, I did a lot of performing uh, I'm a musician, but I did a lot of a lot of theater as well. And I, I think that it, I never really had an interest in being an actor, despite the fact that I did it. Um, I was much more interested in 
well, how do I get there as an actor? How do I get to this point where I'm able to, you know, inhabit the character, however successfully or not, and be able to do it in front of people and shut the world out and go there? Um, how do I get there? And once I understood what my process was, then you, in a lot of ways, you turn into a, you turn into a psychologist because you, you have to sit down with your actors, um, whether it's a movie like this or it's a traditionally scripted narrative like my last one. And, you know, what I like to do is I like to provide the actors with a very, very detailed backstory going all the way back to their childhood and give that to them in print and sit down with them over a couple of drinks, um, whether alone or... It's a hell of a homework assignment there, Eric. (laughs) Well, I feed them beer, so it's okay, (laughs) you know? But um, You tell them the George Carlin story? I Maybe I did, but they actually... they. They were willing to perform for me, and you're not performing for me. Right I'm now. not your trained monkey. <laughs> well, I will never cast you in <laughs> an award-winning found footage. Nor will movie. anyone else, Eric. Story of my life. <laughs> um, no, I just I like to I really like to, to to get deep into this with with people. It's 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 fun, you know. It, it's more than just saying, you know, here are the shots that I want, and you know, action and cut. There's a lot more that goes into it. And every director is different, and my style is different from a lot of people I've worked with. And um, I, I think that has as much to do with sort of our temperament as it has to do with the sorts of films we make. Well, uh, Eric, as, as we get closer to the finish line here, uh, I want to wind the clocks back. Did we start? <laughs> <laughs> Did we start? Are we doing this for Clark, real? Clark has turned around the time clock so it faces me because he's guilting me about time. I don't know why the, I thought these, of my these show. tricks of the trade. Eric. I know. Tricks of the trade. You know, we've been doing this 81 episodes previous. I know what's up. So I, gotta, I told you that when I start talking, people run for the hills. And no, now you're like, wrap it up. We're the here, baby. The music is coming up. No, no, no Iron Maiden hits today. Boom. Oh, oh my God. See, I, <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to do is I take us back. To let's go. All right, so let's go all the way back to Bennigan's. All right, now we got a we got a booth, we got a table. Tell us the first script that you wrote. I was writing before that. Um, I'm more interested the, in the Bennigan days now. I feel like the, we've painted the a, days. Yeah, we feel like a good narrative with the Bennigan story. All right, well, before I get into Bennigan's, I at least have to make myself sound somewhat like a child prodigy and say that when I was in the seventh grade. I took The Hobbit, I adapted it into (laughs) a script for a four-hour radio play and directed it. So that was cool. Now we flash forward to Ben. So you did? Um, Wait, you did it? (laughs) I did it, yes. It's terrible. No one's voice had changed. It's awful. Uh, It's it's garbage, but it's four hours long. (laughs) I applaud you for that. That's that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, we're Hobbit heads here. Not really, but that's just... If you ever want to hear a squeaky voice Gandalf, I can. Oh hell I'm yeah! Looking at the tapes right now, they're sitting right here. <laughs> oh my god! Um, but no, I I was I was writing scripts from I think the time I got my first typewriter when I was you know in the third grade or something. I was trying to write scripts um, for Dracula and, and various sorts of things at a really really young age. Then of course I I turned into a teenage malcontent. Um, I started wearing a wallet chain, smoking cigarettes and <laughs> you joined a terrible garage band. And, um, I started writing, uh, screenplays that were, that I, I guess are very reflective of the way that I think and still make films. A lot of sort of, um, very structured and yet nonlinear, um, storylines, they still sort of adhere to a three act structure while not conforming to, um, you know, an ABC timeline. Uh, so I was, I was really playing with form and, um, I was going to a Bennigan's every night after my <laughs> bookstore job, because it was the place where you could smoke in Columbia, Maryland. And all the waiters knew me because I'd show up with my laptop and my notebooks and my Paul Schrader scripts. And uh, I'd chain smoke and they would uh, bring me cup of coffee after cup of coffee after gin and tonic. And um, yeah, I, I just I'd sit there and I'd write all night long. And 
a very good friend of mine who stars in Butterfly Kisses was a, uh, he was a waiter there and that was how I met him. And of course he was a waiter who wanted to be an actor. And, uh, when his shift was over, he'd sit down and he would start performing in lots of different voices everything I had just written that night, usually for a crowd of people. And we would sit there under a cloud of smoke and dream of the days in the future when we would make movies together. And like, 20 years later, here we are. It's like Paris in the 20s right there. <laughs> Hemingway, Dolly, the whole thing. Exactly. Until the bulldozer came in, they took down the Bennigans, <laughs> and now it's an empty lot. The actor with it. Pay Paradise, put up a parking lot. Oh, God. There you go. <laughs> More you go. terrible references. Uh, well, Eric, uh, I think we did it, man. Wait, can I ask one more? Oh, God damn, go. Uh, we, we have to ask how you got in touch with Eduardo Sanchez and got him to actually, uh, you know, participate. Um, the studio in the film that is doing the post-production editing, uh, they're called Studio Unknown. They're based out of Keatonsville, Maryland. Um, they've worked on a lot of high profile stuff. Uh, I, I had them do my first movie roulette and, um, I developed a relationship with them and just in the past couple of years, they, they've blown up, you know, they just did wonder woman, you know, they're, they're, oh, wow. they're, they're shooting for the sky right now. These guys are fantastic and they're, they're friends of mine as well. And, uh, that's, that's one of the things I always tell filmmakers who are trying to get started in the biz. I'm like, you know, it's all about networking and, trying to, you know, forge real relationships uh, with people around you because you never know where they're going to go and what's going to happen. And in this case, what happened was um, not only was I able to go to them and say, hey, look, I'm going to want you guys to mix and score my next film, Butterfly Kisses, but um, I'm going to want you guys to appear in it. And they were totally game for that. But they also invited me... um, to a seminar they were doing for a local university and uh, they were doing a sound seminar and it was really cool because they were going in and they were demonstrating, you know, like here's a rough cut. Here's what we added to it. We're going to do Foley demos. It was just this really, really cool thing they did in front of this audience. And um, to close this seminar out, they wanted to have um, two filmmakers on stage to talk about their film experiences, particularly in regards to recording sound, the problems they would have on set with that, um, what work needed to be done afterwards, in some cases repair, and um, also how sound could be used creatively to enhance a film. And so they reached out to Ed Sanchez for whom they had done exists and lovely Molly. And, um, they said, Hey, we want you up there because you know, you're a, you're a big time Maryland guy. And Ed was like, sign me up. And then they reached out to me and they said, Eric, we want you there because you're kind of an up and coming Maryland guy. So we want to be able to show sort of, you know, the guy who's made it and the guy who's on his way up and you know how you've had very different experiences, um, on different scales. And I was like, yeah, totally. And so, I got the very, very cool opportunity to meet Ed and to go up on stage and sit next to him and be like, who the fuck cares what I think? This guy directed (laughs) the Blair Witch Project. And, you know, for, you know, he was very gracious and, you know, he'd field questions and go, I think Eric would be, you know, more equipped to respond to that. You know, Eric, you tell me. And he was he was a very, very cool, very down to earth guy um, with absolutely no airs of pretension at all. And. Um, you know, we, we chatted afterwards, we stayed in touch. And when I came to studio unknown and I pitched butterfly kisses and I pitched them playing themselves and said, yeah, I know you're going to be sort of shit talking a client on camera. Um, but I promise I'm going to look like an asshole director myself. Okay. We're all, it's all, it's all a (laughs) gag here. Um, they just said, have you thought about asking Ed to be in the film? Oh God. Yeah. And I was like, you know, guys, I, I thought he'd probably roll his eyes and go, God, man, that's like so 20 years ago or whatever, 15 years ago. And um, they were like, no, you know, seriously, reach out to him, give him a call. And I, I reached out to him. Uh, my my co-producer, Corey Okuchi, knew him and said, you know, I know him better. Let me let me hit him up right now. 
And the next thing I know, we had a meeting at the film office. We sat down. I pitched the film. We talked for about two hours. And not only did Ed agree to appear in the movie, but Ed was also on board throughout the process as we were shooting the thing. We were bringing him cuts, and he was watching it, and he was giving us you know, creative guidance and, and consulting on what we were shaping and putting together. And, you know, he's, he's been involved, you know, sort of silently through the whole process. And he's been very, very, very generous, particularly when some upstart like myself comes in and goes, Hey, you know, that thing you made, I've got the balls <laughs> to tell you how I'm going to do something really cool with it that you, you didn't do. And, you know, it's, you have to, I guess you kind of have to have balls to do that, but um, you don't realize it until after you've opened your mouth. You're like, oh he's shit, in, did I just put my foot in it. He's incredibly <laughs> humble for a dude that made the he Blair is. Witch Project. He's completely... He is. He's also a giant, right? And you're five foot seven? How was that I on have, stage? <laughs> I've got uh, all sorts of photos on the wall of various <laughs> film-related stuff I've done. And there is a picture of me with Ed Sanchez. And I, I don't know if you're aware of his uh, Star Wars memorabilia collection, oh, but he's been featured in documentaries um, about Star Wars fandom because the entire bottom of his house, just room after room after room, is filled with every action figure, every poster, every stand up, every, you know, fast food tie in promotion item to the point where he, there's an entire room that just looks like the stock room at Target with overstock that he just can't put out. And so there is a picture of me being a Star Wars nerd as I am standing next to him, holding a life-size stuffed Ewok. And I swear the Ewok is taller than me. And this guy is like, <laughs> his head is hitting the ceiling. It's ridiculous. That's crazy. We're Star Wars fans too. Randy was just playing with my BB-8. That is not <laughs> a <laughs> euphemism. I think from now on it should be. <laughs> Well, Eric, uh, first of all, thanks so much for uh, staying up late East Coast times to talk to us uh, West Coast flunkies out here. We uh, we greatly appreciate it. Now, you're still very much involved with the film, touring it. Uh, you know, like you said, you got, you're got you working on distribution. So um, can you tell us anything of when uh, the public may be able to see it other than at the <laughs> Unnamed Footage Festival, March 24th and 25th at the Historic Balboa Theater here in San Francisco? Everything you just said, unnamed footage festival. If you are on the West Coast, please go see this movie and not just see it, but find me on Twitter, find me on Facebook. Tell me what you thought of it. I, I'd love to know what you thought of it because the, it, it kills me when I can't come to a screening. Um, not so much because I want people to pat me on the back, but I, I want to know what people thought. I want to see how people respond to it. That's the joy of telling these sorts of stories. So if you're listening right now, go see it and then hit me up. Let me know what you thought of it. Other than that, we have um, a number of festivals coming up, some stuff I'm not allowed to announce yet, but we're going to be uh, rolling uh, through various festivals throughout the year. And the hope right now is around Halloween, there will be a DVD, Blu-ray, VOD release. Oh. And, um, We'll, we'll try to shoot the bat signal up in the sky and make people aware of it. Wow, that's great. For sure. Yeah, we'll stay uh, ears to the ground and uh, get that going. Yeah, please awesome. keep us updated. I'd love to promote that. Absolutely. And guys, I really, really appreciate um, being uh, way late at the theater and uh, <laughs> almost I thought I was going to be mugged outside. But um, I, I would have been. Russ, did you have your vest on? <laughs> oh, God. I don't know what that is. I don't know a bit. Uh, what no, a bit. No, no, you, <laughs> no, no, You're you a scary were, looking ogre. Were, no, I'm not. You were really, really cool. Hey, Eric, I did not hear from my me. life whatsoever. Thank you. Um, but no, no, I, I, I'm really grateful that you guys reached out and that you were as enthusiastic as you were and that you wanted to show it uh, at the Unnamed Footage Festival and um, that you had me on the show here. Uh, this has been a lot of fun and I've been looking forward to it and I hope I get to do it again. Literally minutes after the screening, Russell called me and then we got you. Oh, he was there. Yeah. I was like, hey, I'm going to call Clark right now. Yeah. So, yeah, wheels were in motion as soon as he saw the movie. And so. also, I don't know how scary I could be when, like he said, the first screening did not have a lot of people and uh, the, it, there was no host for his Q&A. So he jumped downstairs and went, hey, uh, we're all here. Um, let's just talk Q and a. And then after I went, Hey dude, I'm sorry. I'm too anxious to talk in front of five people. But, uh, if you believe it or not, I do a podcast. <laughs> so I don't know 
There's no way you could be scared of that. No, not at all. Not at all. It was it was a really it was a really good conversation. You and your 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 group, everybody was fantastic. And yeah. Uh, no, I'm I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. By group, he meant Oksana and Terrell was there. Okay, and they took yes. a good picture together. Okay, let's let him go. <laughs> no, never. Eric, <laughs> thank you so much, man. We appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Have a great night. You too. Bye, Eric.